Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Mad Mamluks. I'm Mahi and I'm joined by my co hosts, Sheikh Amr Saeed and Sim. And on today's show, we have a very special guest, esteemed journalist and activist, Dr. Yvonne Ridley. Dr. Ridley, first of all, thank you for coming on our show. And before we get started, I wanted to ask you in 2008, you were voted the most recognizable woman in the Islamic world. Um, how does that make, like, a title like that, how does that make you feel? Um. Well, I, it was, um, it was an accolade that, uh, gosh, you know, I was really surprised at and, and, um, and quite humbled. Um, but, you know, it was just the, um, the Muslim world, so I can still go about my business in, um, in Britain without being stopped or hassled. Um, so, yes, it, I mean, it was... Um, it was one of those sort of wow, alhamdulillah moments. Um, yeah, I was surprised. You know, you, it, it's amazing because before this podcast was started, um, I was just having a conversation with my mom, and she was like, "Oh, who's the guest?" And I'm like, I was, "Part part of me was like, uh, like how much time do I have to ex- spend to explain my mom I was a little bit older, you know." But I'm like, oh, Yvonne Ridley, she's a journalist. I don't know if you... She's like, oh, I know about her. Oh, that's so amazing. I'm so proud of you. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I had no idea. Even just, you know, um, my mom would know you. And that just goes to say that, you know, that accolade is just so warranted. Um, I, I was just... One of, one of the funny things about you, or at least your story, as you as many of many people know already, we're not going to go do a origin story we kind of agreed before the show like um but your many of the your opponents kind of tried to um label you as someone who's a victim of stockholm syndrome and like uh and i think now that you've had so many years of islam under your belt can you define that real quick stockholm syndrome is like something that is um hostages who end up having sympathy for their captors and they end up um, believing in whatever message or ideology that they hmm. are espousing, so well, with your captors, yeah, and, you know the um, if well, the, I, I was held by the Taliban for eleven days, and far from bonding with them, um, I spat at them, I swore at them, I cursed them. I heard you smacked them too. Is that true? I. <laughs> is that true? And, when, and they didn't do anything back? Is that true? When they released me, I don't know who was happiest to see the back of me. You know, <laughs> them or, or or me crossing that border back into Pakistan. And it, it was... Um, so I always laugh when I hear, you know, oh yeah, she's a victim of Stockholm Syndrome. She embraced the religion of her captors. And uh, it was a full two years or so before I did embrace Islam and the experience with the Taliban did trigger the interest, uh, but not on the level that uh, my critics um, would think. And, um, you know, as for Stockholm Syndrome, um, <laughs> it's, it's just not true. In fact, I think there's probably a few Taliban that are still being seriously cancelled from uh, the experience. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for sure. So I re- remember um, reading about you that you, one of your, um, especially in light of the recent developments this week, the last few, you know, with the UAE and Palestine, that you were you were interested in the Palestinian cause even as a youth, pre-Islam and all that. Can you walk me? Th- can you walk us through a little bit uh, about like how how that came to be? Because you know, obviously, the narrative in the West for the average, especially from someone of European descent, is you know not going to be favorite uh, favorable for the Palestinian cause. Well, um, it was um, in the early seventies, and the, the Palestinians had a reputation for hijacking airliners and and even a cruise ship. And I remember at school, someone asked me to sign a petition in support of the Palestinians. And I said, why would I do that? You know, these people are terrorists. And 
the person who asked me to sign the petition said, well, what do you know about these people? And in truth, I knew nothing. And so they walked me through um, the Nakba. How would I feel if my land was stolen from me and, and um, if I was left homeless? And when I heard this story, I just said, no, that, that can't have happened. It, it just wouldn't happen. And they said that it had. Um, so I signed the petition. I still wasn't convinced, so I started reading about how um, the Palestinians lost their land. And then I started getting more in, into it. And I was um, outraged that this could have happened and nobody was doing anything about it or nobody seemed to be doing anything about it. So I very much uh, became um, embraced in the Justice for Palestine calls. And uh, as a 13 year old, I could see quite clearly the injustices that had been meted out against the Palestinian people. And uh, I was um, horrified. Did you, how do you feel about a lot of the narrative that goes on now, at least by some of the opponents uh, for from Palestine or any kind of um, uh, causes that are against oppression and, and injustice that, you know what, these, um, these people who are from the West, they, they kind of take their... Um, association with with the uh, white privilege and they they use that to um garner support and and it, it seems like a silly question at first but now it seems just seems like it's like gaining traction among certain circles in social media where people are trying to discredit you just based on your race and 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 a lot of the discussion is just becoming focused around the race of the person who is fighting or trying to be an activist rather than the actual issue at hand? Well, it, it's, um, you know, this, this whole business about white privilege, I never really understood it until I read a book earlier uh, this year, or maybe it was last year, called um, White Fragility by um, a white woman called Robin D'Angelo, and she has spent the last few years in America uh, trying to discuss the issue of race uh, in corporate America with um, white people uh, who don't think they are racist, who don't think they've got an issue with race. But oh my God, when you start to read her book, um, I kept seeing myself in different chapters thinking, oh, this is me. Um, and I didn't think that uh, that I was racist. And really, I would urge all white people to, to read this book or to acquaint themselves anyway with the whole business of white fragility. And, you know, it's not to say that there aren't prejudices out there against women, against people of faith, people of no faith. Uh, people of color, um, gender issues, you know. Uh, do you, do you think... Do, desire, I think, to put people in a box, and we're all guilty of it. Um, do, but, do, uh, do you think it's more about race or maybe about a certain bro bro brought up um, people who are raised... I, I know I can attest to um, just me and my family, people who grew up um in in some in a lot better of a situation than uh, many other people do in uh, lower classes we have i think a certain level of privilege in our education in our neighborhoods in our education or education systems in our all, every facet of our life has some kind of a privilege that comes along with it so i i sometimes i feel like the narrative just becomes around hating white people and associating all of 
uh, all white people with um, the evils of colonialism, the evil of slavery, and things like that. And the, the the focus gets shifted away from the actual oppression that's happening again and becomes um, focused around identity politics. And one of the, the things, at least, I've talked to our listeners about and, uh, uh, you know, try to bring up the message about the evils of, of capitalism mm. itself that has permeated into all of our minds where we're more focused on what benefits me over anyone else and me and my selfish desires are are the principal uh, are, are the basically the substrate right the the foundation of our thought and everything else emanates from those that that principle so you know as muslims we're supposed to have uh, we're supposed to espouse the shahada as our as our underlying principle right but i think a lot of people tell say that you know uh, oh yeah you know our foundation our belief system is all founded on this this one statement but when you actually kind of dig down and you do some digging in your own mind you find out that well it's not really as clear as that i think people would be surprised to find how much their own selfishness that has come about from capitalist principles and tendencies has permeated into their action and, and we can make so many examples related to that related to just um uh the uh the concern that we have for various issues that are happening in the world and sometimes people will um benefit will will be more um will more will, will try to bring about an issue when it has to do with something that is in line with their interest and what i'm i guess what i'm trying to get at is we are now seeing a treaty that was made with the uh, zionist state of israel and we're seeing a lot of uh, or not necessarily a lot but a few muslim scholars sheikh abdullah bin baya hamza yusuf etc who have said you know what this treaty is okay to be made with the uae and israel and 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 people such as myself have been saying that you know what there is some level of interest that is being aligned with them and this uh uh this treaty you know and why they've actually made it a focus of their their uh, narrative or their communication with the muslim Umar. well what are your thoughts on that well you know, to be brutally honest, um, this treaty isn't worth the paper it's written on. Before the ink was dry, uh, Netanyahu was saying it doesn't mean the annexation of the West Bank is off the table. So why sign a treaty and say, oh yeah, we're doing this uh, deal with Israel because, you know, we have uh, stopped the annexation of the West Bank. The UAE has stopped nothing. The UAE has been trading with Israel under the table for quite a few years. Um, they've looked for an excuse to um, go out in the open. Um, you know, if they want to trade with Israel, be honest about it. Stop doing it under the table. Um, why are you doing it? It's not for the interests of the Palestinians. Um, and and we, we know that. Um, the UAE, and, and we're not talking about the people of the UAE, the Emiratis. We're talking about the elite ruling class, um, the royal family of the UAE, who are great patrons of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, um, which is why he often comes under attack as a scholar for dollar um, type person. Um, I would have much more respect for what um, the Sheikh says if he wasn't receiving lots of dollars from the UAE, and he is. Um, yeah, is that a fact? Or was that something that that's been debated? They it's, they haven't denied it. Um, that's at least what I've at least because in our show we've had this discussion several he times. Goes and to the UAE, he goes to the royal palaces there. Um, you know, which is fine. 
uh, you know, he's. Um, I've met him, and uh, and um, on a, on a one-to-one -one basis, um, you know, I have respect for him and his knowledge. But be honest, be honest. Why you think it's okay to um, support Israel and not the Palestinians? Because by this treaty, uh, you're not supporting the Palestinians at all. And the UAE, it doesn't matter how much. Um, you see, I knew this would happen. Oh, no, that's all right. totally fine. There's no problem. That happens to our Sheikh Hammer all the time. <laughs> maybe maybe, fact, maybe they the can house. join the show too. <laughs> Put them on a line. <laughs> First time caller, long time listener. <laughs> um, it's probably Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. <laughs> but, you know, be honest. Uh, why you are entering into this treaty and it's not for the benefit of the Palestinians. The truth is, um, let's face it, when you look at the, uh, the rulers of the OIC across the Arab world, they couldn't care less about the Palestinians. If they did, Palestine would be free by now. I've often said if Palestine was sandwiched in between Turkey and Algeria, it would be free by now. Hmm. But it's not. Now, do you think it is surrounded by some of the most treacherous, tyrannical rulers in the Middle East? And uh, you know, I'm I'm sorry, uh, they haven't helped the Palestinians at all, and the Palestinians need to. Um, to wake up and, and get rid of the fossils that are trying to control them at the moment in Ramallah and start standing up for themselves and um, get the new generation of Palestinian thinkers and politicians um, standing up for them and, uh, and, and, you know, don't rely on the Arab world. What, what would, sorry, what would you say to the what would you say to uh, the individuals who would support some scholars and some of them are of the opinion you just mentioned that we need to uh, incite and encourage people to stand up um, mm -hmm. and become thinkers some people may say and i'm just playing devil's advocate here some people may say well they've been trying to stand up for a long time it brings nothing but bloodshed just let this policy go through and let this treaty go through because there'll be less bloodshed in this situation um and i it's i personally believe it's a naive way of thinking but there's some people i've heard um that said that that's the reason why a lot of the scholars do that is because they want less bloodshed to occur the preservation of human life is the highest principle yeah. and we should we don't have any means to fight back so might as well lie over and take it um if you don't stand up for a principle what are you going to stand up for? Yeah. You know, it, it's... Um, I come from a working class background. And, you know, there have been various um, revolutions around the world. Inevitably, most of them um, involve bloodshed. Historically, most of them involve bloodshed. There is a price to pay. And, you know, you look at the words of um, the likes of Malcolm X. Um, I was, you know, I'm a big fan of, of his legacy. And you are not going to win freedom or get justice by putting your hand up and saying, please, sir, um, can, can, I, uh, can I do this? And, uh, you know, we, we have seen people power. And when the people start to move, the leaders start to follow. And if they don't follow, they become irrelevant. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, uh, with the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening, um, it was snuffed out very quickly with billions and billions of dollars from Saudi the UAE um, to to stop this um, this outbreak of democracy, and um, it, it's it's tragic. 
fortunately, Tunisia has still managed to cling on to the democracy that, uh, you know, came very, uh, it was hard won by, but they, despite money being channeled in with, uh, you know, millions and millions of do dollars channeled in to undermine uh, that democracy, Tunisia is still standing. Libya is a basket case at the moment, and um, and and would have uh, Tripoli would have fallen um, had it not been for the intervention of Turkey uh, by President Erdogan. Um, I look round at, at in Egypt. There was a military coup, uh, but if you live in Egypt, you're not allowed to even say that. And, and uh, the d democracy was snuffed out um, before it even had a chance to flourish. And you look at Yemen, um, it, it, millions displaced. You look at uh, Syria, millions displaced. And still, you know, the tyranny is there. And, and uh, you know, who is, who is funding all this unrest? It is the rulers who give uh, money to the likes of Hamza Yusuf to turn around and say, life is so precious. Well, I would rather die a free person than die in chains. Now then, it's easy enough for me to say that. That's what they would say. They're, that's what uh, the, Their argument is always exactly that. That yeah. you being in the West, it's very easy and convenient for you wide-eyed social justice warriors to um, talk from the comfort of your homes in the suburbs of the United Kingdom, the United States and Australia to be uh, espousing all these idealist views. But these are the people who are suffering on the ground. And if we don't make peace with the people who are oppressing them, then um, they're going to die and they're going to have a very horrible um, life, you know. Well, as I say, you just look around at uh, places where the revolutions have worked or are working, and it's um, you know you just take take heart uh, by an inspiration from these uh, these revolutions. You know, we're seeing it in parts of a part of Europe at the moment. Um, the, the last real authoritarian ruler um, and, and people are rising up against him. There comes a point where people realize that living without hope, living in chains, living under tyranny, living with the boot on your neck is not worth it. And uh, we're looking at uh, Black Lives Matter. You know, that's going through a watershed moment. Um, and it's incredible that in the 21st century, the scenes that we are seeing in the so-called greatest democracy in the world, America, um, with black people rising, the thing that makes Black Lives Matter so important, I think, this time around, is that white people are getting involved because they realize that, you know, people uh, cannot live under tyranny or injustice, whether it's where in the world it is. It and, affects everybody. Uh, yeah. You know, people, people have paid the uh, the price for, for this uh, fight. So, uh, yes, it's very easy for me to to say but um i think that's actually very humble for you to say that because you actually came into the fold of islam understanding and you actually felt you know and i i think it was amazing that you felt that they were going to kill you anyway when you were in afghanistan and you were still fighting back at them and you saw death you stared death right in its face and you continued to fight them you spat at them and you saw that you were the only prisoner that was released and just if i should if i can give you you know um i we all firmly believe that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
places people uh, in certain situations so rest of the world can witness. And I think you're amongst one of those people, mashallah, because Allah made your story prevalent. That's what we refer to as qubul, acceptance from Allah, right? I was in Mauritania in, from end of 2001, basically 2002, to halfway point of 2003. I was living with some British brothers. And I'm going to be quite frank, I didn't know about Yvonne Ridley, now sister Yvonne Ridley back then. And um, so I was living with these brothers, and some of them used to have a radio and they used to listen to BBC, they used to listen to, you know, I think it was Sky News or a bunch of different news channels, and I wasn't really interested in news, you know. I just knew that the Afghans were going to war and Muslims all around the world were doing lots of dua for the Afghans and the civilians that were going to be collateral uh, damage, right? So I hear there's about four British brothers, that three British brothers that I was with, they're like, Yvonne Ridley became Muslim. She was in captivity and she became Muslim. And that really sparked my interest. And mind you, I'm in a place where there's no electricity. At night, we used to use candlelight in a remote desert area. This is 100%. I'm not exaggerating anything. And I was like, who's this Yvonne Ridley? And they're like, she became Muslim. She was in captivity. Uh, she was in the stories are saying that she wasn't afraid. And she smacked one of the, uh, uh, one of the Taliban guys. They didn't do anything back. They didn't like. And then I heard that when I went to the city, I started reading up on you. And more stories started, more stories started coming out that you were able to tell the story. And it comes from your journalist background, obviously, that you were able to tell the story of what you were doing and how you were feeling and what their reaction was. You could have told the whole world that they mistreated you and you would have never came to Islam. Maybe. You could have said that because no one else is going to deny what you said. That story would be amazing. People would be like, of course they mistreated her. There's a Taliban, right? But rather, you were telling people that they didn't like to make eye contact with you. You thought that there was something weird that they didn't like to make eye contact with you because they were going to kill you anyway. So the guilt, that's the detail that you went in. Am I, if I'm not, and you correct me if I'm wrong. You said that they didn't want to make eye contact with you because of the guilt that they were going to feel because they were going to kill you. And this is what's going through your mind. So you've already faced death. Well, it's a cultural clash. I had no idea that they were showing me great respect. And I just thought, they can't even look me in the eye because they've decided already that they're going to kill me. Yes. And, you know, once you know you're going to die, um, there's nothing else to really hold you back. Yes, my point and, exactly. So no one yeah. can say that to you. And mm -hmm. alhamdulillah, I don't think you should feel that about yourself that, you know, give in to that argument when people say to you that, you know, uh, you know, it's very easy for you to say because it's actually not easy for you to say because I'm pretty sure you have to relive all those moments. The other thing is you recently went, I mean, you recently went to Idlib to visit Bilal Abdul Karim. It's a beautiful interview for those of you guys who are watching. It's a little less than an hour. Bilal Abdul Karim interviewed you in Idlib. You're, I mean, frankly speaking, your life was on the line. It could have been very easily. You went there understanding all the possibilities of what could have happened. May Allah make everything easy for Bilal Abdul Karim. He's in a, a pretty uh, dire situation right now, which we discussed in the last episode. But, um, you know, that, that that's not a very easy place to be in. And you have to be ready to, you know, frankly speaking, you have to be ready to die to go in those situations. And a majority of the world voluntarily doesn't go in that situation. Right? It's very well, difficult. What are your thoughts about... Uh Syria about the current status of you know Bilal Abdul Karim and, and Tak Sharif another humanitarian aid worker who's been arrested um, and it's a, such a difficult situation because many of us who have been following the the Syrian resistance have, have always had been sympathetic towards HTS and uh, because they were the only resistance for uh, protecting the Syrian uh, Muslims against uh, the oppression of Bashar Assad and here we have the last bastion of hope, um, you know, hurting and imprisoning and torturing our own fellow Muslim brothers uh, who have, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a reputation, a sparkling reputation, you know, a reputation that precedes, uh, that, that goes beyond what any one of us could have sacrificed. Uh, um, they've sacrificed everything. And when we see our, our brothers who've left our the comfort of, of the West and gone over there to help them, 
and uh, them being treated the way they, they are, it, it's very disheartening. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure many people think, well, thank God we didn't go um, over there. And I hope they don't think that, but I'm, I'm betting there are people who are saying like, oh, I told you so. You know what? To see, this, this is what uh, the HTS and all the rebel groups are all about. They, they're not, It's not about Islam. It's all about um, power and things like that. So, what are your thoughts about all that? What the whole situation right now? I'm really disappointed with HTS because um, torture and abuse has absolutely no place in Islam. No ifs, buts, or maybes. There is no room for torture and abuse in Islam. And I'm coming from a point of knowledge on this because I was held by a bunch of guys in Afghanistan that I was told were the most brutal, evil regime in the world and they hated women. Um, yet they treated me with a respect and courtesy I had not expected. I, After I uh, was released on humanitarian grounds, um, on the orders of Mullah Omar, who was the then spiritual leader of the Taliban, obviously I took a keen interest um, in everything that they, they did after that. And a few years later, Mullah Omar uh, released a document uh, called the rules of jihad and this was his interpretation um, his Islamic interpretation of how you should conduct warfare and so I immediately went to the section on prisoners and he made it crystal clear there is no room for torture abuse detention without trial of prisoners of war and uh, he he was very firm on that and I would guess um, his, as, although he's died uh, since I would guess that uh, that document is still relevant today and the fact that HTS um, is choosing to cherry pick it's an interpretation of uh, detainees I find that very sad I don't care if they are holding whoever they're holding whatever they've done every single prisoner should be treated exactly the same one of the things that really impressed me about Islam was the theme of justice justice not just for your friends and your family but for your enemies too. And I thought, gosh, you know, how fair is that, that you deliver justice in equal measure for your own family, for your friends, and for your enemy. And, and there are so many stories supporting this that um, I am disappointed with HTS. Uh, they are well aware of my feelings and I am in contact with them. I am concerned about prisoner welfare. And the thing that really hurts me about this is that uh, Bilal Abdul Karim was actually uh, working with scholars of Islam to yeah. try and come up with a definitive document for uh, prisoners in Syria. And uh, it's so ironic that uh, that he is now um, a prisoner um, in in Syria. I'm just so disappointed because you know the Syrian people rose up to get rid of um, Assad because he was a tyrant, a bully, a man who tortured. Since that civil war started more than 11 million syrians have fled or, or been displaced the syrian people did not rise up to have 
uh, one regime replaced by another brutal regime. You but know, what, if there's torture in Syria, leave that to, to, well, we know that there's torture in Syria, leave that to Assad. HTS, uh, they'll see this. I would say to them, you are better than this. What's their motive, though, behind this? What's their motive behind um, once being uh, a group for the people and now torturing journalists? And if I'm not mistaken, Bilal Abdul Karim was actually doing his best to help them, right? Or do you think it's a thing where you're almost like, that's what you're seeing? You know how you're, if you you become your oppressor? Hmm. You know that well, that, you, that's why I'm asking her because she's in touch with them, right? Yeah. She's in touch like, with what's the mindset going what, on? Yeah, yeah. What's, what's the motive behind all this? Um, I think that uh, the uh, rulers in HTS um, are under tremendous pressure. They're mm. holding on to this one tiny area of Syria. Once it goes, that is the end of it. Um, Assad will be back in control. Um, so they're under tremendous pressure. And I think that uh, they have lost sight of the fact that their friends will tell them the truth. But and what does that mean, though? That they're going wrong. What does that mean that they're under pressure? Like, I, I know that it, it, I feel like it's a little general, but do you think you could expand a little on that? Like, of course, they're under tremendous pressure, but what is the normal. link between they're the they're torture got, and the captivity? Forces. They've got barrel bombs, chemical weapons being thrown at them. They've got uh, Russian fighter jets bombing them. They've got Iranian militia on the ground. You know, they've got huge pressure coming in from all sides yes and you know let's be honest um if it wasn't for turkey they would have been crushed by now let's be brutally frank about this there would be no resistance um but for turkey's intervention in uh, in syria a lot of people in syria you know s still believe in the resistance still believe in freedom, still do not want to live under the tyranny of Assad again. And so there's a, a you, there's such a lot at stake. However, when you get elements of HTS acting like the Assad regime, it's not acceptable. So that, that's what I'm asking. Why are they doing Why did they resort to torture now? What's the link between pressure and torture here? I, I think are you are you asking for the actual reason why they they imprisoned them? Because they didn't they the HDS hasn't released that have they, Ivan? Mm, I I wrote an article recently saying don't shoot the messenger, and uh, Bilal Abdul Karim is actually a good friend of HTS. Yes, as much as his presence. Um, and the presence of um, OGN or on the ground news in uh, Idlib meant there was freedom of speech, um, a little flame of, of hope. Now, good friends will tell you things that you don't want to hear, hmm. but only your good friends will tell you that. And unfortunately, it seems as though there were fragile egos within HTS that uh, would rather Bilal Abdul Karim had kept his mouth shut. Hmm. And because he wouldn't remain quiet, they decided to silence him by having him arrested and locked up. Would you happen um, to know any types of stuff they wanted him to stay silent on? And he wasn't, you know, I don't mean to pry too much, but just to give it like a more complete, you know, uh, we want to have like all of us just generally like a de in depth understanding of how these things work and why they happen. Like, so uh, yeah, I think that was about the what Bilal did was he reported on Tak Sharif's imprisonment and he said that um, the beatings that Tak's has taken in prison has not been released, that uh, he's been. Um, he has bruises and things like that on his, I think on his feet. When, when he was released, you know, he had a cut on his forehead. Yeah. Um, it didn't take a, a rocket scientist to work out what had uh, been going on. 
Um, there it was, mounting evidence of torture. And like any journalist, you get an exclusive, you want to break it. And... Well, especially since the, the 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 narrative was that no, he's or someone I don't know someone was on OGN, and they were explaining that oh he's he's doing all right, Tox is doing all right, he's in good spirits, he's in good condition, and Bilal came on like a little while later and said no no no, Tox is not doing all right. I don't know why this is being reported. So the next question is why was Tox in in this situation then? That's what no one has given an explanation from HTS as to what exactly Tox did to get himself in prison. Mm. Because he he got released and then in prison again, right? Go ahead, Yvonne. This is a war zone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, People who deliver aid um, have a very tough job in a war zone where there are shortages of everything and they come under all sorts of pressure of course. as well. Um, Tox, uh, Tokia Sharif, um, who I met when I was out there, w- was an incredibly popular character. Um, he was delivering aid to widows and orphans, people whose very lives depended on um, on his uh, weekly visits, giving out uh, food and and uh, getting involved with other projects. There's a lot of there's about 250 Westerners out there who are involved in humanitarian um, aid projects and trying to navigate the political landscape of um, of a war zone where you've got lots of different uh, groups. Uh, running a resistance against Assad. It's not that easy. And uh, obviously they've um, uh, Tox and and, and, uh, some of his supporters have rubbed people up the the wrong way. Um, Similarly, uh, Bilal Abdul Karim, while not giving out humanitarian aid, he's, he's still performing a vital function by getting news out to the rest of the world what is happening in this heroic little spot in Syria that is fighting um, Assad's forces and you know it's it's like reporting on a football match if there's a foul or the referee pulls out a red card or there's an own goal Mm. uh, you report it and HTS, um, there are some very fragile egos who didn't like what Bilal Abdul Karim hmm. was reporting, and um, they've silenced him by locking him up. They've been in, they've emptied his studios, and and uh, brought, you know, made it almost impossible for OGN to to function in Syria, and. This is, you know, the mother of all own goals. And I've I've tried to tell them that the moment they arrested Bilal Abdul Karim, the biggest cheers came from Assad's forces, from the Iranians, from Hmm. um, the Russians. And, you know, who've all had uh, Bilal Abdul Karim on their kill list. Uh, Even the US government has allegedly had him under uh, on a on a kill list, and then which would explain why he's been targeted in five different U.S. drone attacks. In fact, he took legal action to try and get to the to the bottom of it. Everybody wants him killed. You know that should tell HTS. This is you know let him out of prison and let him do the job that he's doing so well, which is delivering the truth. Not to mention. Now, not to mention all the support that Bilal and Tox have throughout the UK and the US and, and the West in general, in in terms of their honesty, their integrity, their, their 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 level of journalism, they're just people who you cannot, um, you know, throw allegations against. You can't. You cannot. Uh, no one's beyond reproach. We, let's understand that for sure. But you, you can't just imprison them without charge, and you can't. You have to explain to them and like what exactly they did and this goes to show that at least from our own experience even just from the podcast and how we've met various people throughout our journey in the show is that we have a problem within even muslim leadership where we don't 
We don't know how to accept criticism. And I think just a simple thing like that, I, I think it's just, it's so sad to see. Have, have you received any feedback from HTS as far as why they did it? Well, you, you're illustrating the points of why it doesn't make sense for them, but you know, when you're communicating with them, like what's their justification? They said, they said that he was working against them. Hmm. And I said what I've just told you before, don't yeah. you realize that the biggest cheers, the moment you locked him up came from the Russians, the Syrian, mm. the Assad Syrians, and and the Iranians. And it's chaos. The war is yeah. chaos. In the job for them, and um, but the the trouble you see, uh, the Arab world is, and I'm probably going to sound quite ethnocentric here, but the Arab world is not used to having a free media. Al Jazeera. Uh, came into the the Arab world and raised the bar in um, in the standard of reporting. You know, Al Jazeera Arabic. Um, it it was a fearless uh, brand of reporting, and it it, it just I, I, it was magnificent, and it it really was um, fantastic that uh, that Al Jazeera came onto the scene. The squeals of protest came from all of those tyrants and despots and dictators and rulers who did not want a light being shone on their particular patch, who did not want somebody holding truth uh, to power. And um, but it, it seemed to open the the floodgates. Unfortunately. Um, it, it's uh, Al Jazeera is banned in some countries. Some countries have pulled the plug on Al Jazeera because, um, you know, as I said before, don't shoot the messenger. And um, it's it's really sad. As long as Bilal Abdul Karim was shouting and broadcasting and interviewing and questioning and, and challenging. Um, you knew that there was freedom of speech in Idlib. That has gone now. That has gone. And I am so sad on so many different levels that mm. uh, that has happened. Yvonne, uh, sorry, you have a yeah, I'll, you, if you guys are done with, because yeah. there's a lot of questions coming about Turkey on the okay. live stream, on the feed. Yeah. Anything on Syria you guys want to cover else? No, or? we're good, we're good, man. So tur you mentioned Turkey in a positive light a few times, right? Um, you talked about how if Palestine was bordered by Turkey, some of the feedback coming in are critical of Turkey as far as like, how can we say that when they've been supportive of China or they have these relations? Um, can you illustrate your, basically your, how, how do you look at Turkey and the government of Erdogan? Um, I, I look at it uh, as largely positive and I'm puzzled about the, the China thing because um, when the plight of the Uyghurs first really came uh, to prominence, Erdogan was critical. Um, and, and, you know, when the uh, re-education camps, news of that filtered out, Erdogan was critical. But he's also a statesman and he has to uh, negotiate and, uh, and do business with uh, a lot of different um, countries and China is one of them. And I, would, um, I wouldn't be too despondent by his proximity to Beijing because if anybody can speak up for the Uyghurs and do something for them, um, I believe it's the president of Turkey. Do you think that's just a natural, you mentioned he's a statesman, right? So is that just a reality we just got to deal with? Like, do you think like at the end of the day, he's the he's the best scenario that we have? Because some people will say that's setting the bar really low. Well, it it might be a, a low bar. Um, I personally don't think it is. But um, who else is there? Who else is there in the Muslim world who is doing anything for the Palestinians, for the Libyans? You know, I have friends living in Tripoli, and they really thought 
that the end was was near for them because um, Haftar, uh, General Haftar, it, it isn't known for his uh, being a benevolent individual. <laughs> And um, Tripoli was on the point of falling if it hadn't been for the intervention of Erdogan. So, um, well, I, well, one of the difficult things, Yvonne, is that China has such a counterweight on any kind of narrative that you you want to say, whether you know it was Erdogan or Imran Khan. They invited those leaders over to their country. They could have been not even doing anything to even hide their oppression when those leaders came and visited the, the East Turkestan Uyghurs. And uh, they, they would have had to said, say what China wanted them to say because it's either... So when, when a lot of these leaders uh, and for, for listeners who aren't uh, you know really following this stuff, they're, they're trying to uh, get whatever they can from either China or America or someone who's um, another power might be Russia it could be some other uh, weaker power but it's all about leveraging whatever um, resources they can to uplift their economy and keep it from collapsing and we already know the Turkish economy is al already has been on the brink of collapse uh, a few times already so Erdogan can't afford to make uh, enemies with China at, at this moment, at least from what I could tell, and that's why he has had to say what he he, he had to say regarding East Turkestan not being um, that the detainees over there are not being oppressed. Well, I'll that may be one way of looking at it, but I mean, I remember writing about the plight of the Uyghurs years ago, and and there was uh, the British Queen in the golden coach giving the VIP treatment to China's ruler um, in during a state visit in London. And uh, now suddenly Britain has discovered the plight of the Uyghurs and is highly critical of China, just as America is highly critical of China. Um, Trump would suddenly drop everything and embrace uh, Beijing if they would uh, do business with him um, but he's found it a very hard nut to crack unfortunately you're right you know power influence wealth uh, geopolitics it all yeah. comes into it and, um, and at the moment um, it's very trendy in the west to support the Uyghur and and you know i i do hope that they get justice and i do hope that they get help delivered to them but i judging from what has happened in tibet i doubt that china is going to listen to anyone at the moment about the um about the plight of the uyghurs and you know when you look around the world um you can see that uh, Beijing might be emboldened into such action when you, you know, a couple of years ago, 750,000 Rohingya fled uh, Burma uh, or Myanmar and, and, and went to Bangladesh. I mean, that was a wholesale ethnic cleansing job and you look at the United Nations, the reason it was formed in the first place of nations coming together in the name of peace and justice. And, uh, and, and you look at where we are today, you know, after the Holocaust, the big cry was never again. And yet we had the Rwandan genocide, uh, what happened in uh, the Congo um, Srebrenica, uh, the Rohingya, and now the Uyghur. Never again. It's happening every year almost. You know, some sort of abuse, some sort of atrocity. Uh, the UN is clearly not fit for purpose. So it's very easy to have a go at individual uh, groups. But um, 
the whole world needs fixing and we all need to raise the bar so much higher and at the moment it's just getting lower by the day and a, a concurrent theme just throughout whatever we've, we've talked about so far has been that each of these things are being utilized as, as tools of power you know whether it's controlling what Bilal Abdul Karim wants to say and uh, or what other one can can influence in regards to his his speech and and his support or Imran Khan etc etc everyone is trying to utilize something to um, leverage against another uh, another entity another political entity it's, it's all about maximizing or finding whatever tools that are available to them to exert influence and power you know and uh, I think it's just fascinating to think at least from uh, so, someone who's in a position such as yourself Yvonne that you've come so far since your own journey when you were young learning about the Palestinians and and where social justice has kind of taken itself to in, in almost ridiculous levels where um, people are no longer when we were young we we just we knew what oppression was we knew what injustice was and now there's some ridiculous levels of oppression that you're seeing from the younger crowd where people who are not necessarily oppressed are kind of claiming themselves to be victims and i, I was kind of curious to know what your thoughts are on that in in terms of what the younger generation the millennials um, have kind of taken justice towards it and, and kind of almost become a, a parody. Uh, you know, well, the, <laughs> each generation has looked on the new generation as, oh my goodness, you know, what, what on earth is this coming along? So it's, I suppose in some ways it's quite easy to look at the millennials and think, gosh, what a self-centered, um, self-opinionated uh, bunch of, of uh, people but um, I have one of the things that I do is go around the universities and, and talk um, especially to Islamic societies and I am incredibly impressed by the quality of people of Muslims coming through today and I'm optimistic I really am um, optimistic. You need to visit the United States. <laughs> you would be very depressed. <laughs> Our, you know, everybody said that Americans don't have a sense of humor. Um, you've proved otherwise, but, you know, <laughs> let's, let's not get Trump in again, please. Trump in again. <laughs> uh, our, our MSAs are, are so desperate for members that I think so many of them, at least that have been reported to us, have complained that there's not even any brothers who want to, who want to participate in the MSA or Islamic societies, as, as they call it in the UK, that the sisters have taken reign in in these. Uh, well, that's, that's always been the case. No, I, I was the president of my MSA. My board is all sisters, and I made sure it was that way because I knew they were the ones that were going to do all the work. It, it started when... <laughs> like, we, reality, when we, I mean, even like this 2005, right? So... It was like the brother back then. I remember we have dawah. It's like the sister shouldn't be given dawah at the dawah tables. It's like, all right, brothers, when you when, when you want to cover your shift, it's like, no, nah, I have a you know I'm a pre med student. I don't have time for this. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I don't want anybody to do anything. The sisters can't do nothing, but I'm not gonna do anything either. So I don't think it's anything new. I, I'm curious. I think Sim was kind of alluding to in the U S. He he was kind of taking a, a shot at like the social justice inclined Muslims <laughs> in the U S. But uh. <laughs> I don't know if that's any different in the UK. I mean, what's your because you, you you mentioned um, like the the, BL, the Black Lives Matter movement and stuff, and so we've had a variety of takes on that on this show here on that movement, right? Um, it seems like you have a, a more or less a positive. We've always tried to distinguish between the organization and the actual um, work that's being done. I think they're two different things, right? Um, but w w what's what's your like? L let's talk a little bit about, about that. Like, what do you see? Like, do you guys have that similar kind of? I don't think you guys have those racial relations as like severely problematic as we have in the U.S. because of our history. Um. Well, 
there, there have been deaths in custody of, of uh, people of colour uh, and not one single prosecution of a police officer has ever been uh, made from deaths in custody. So we, we do have um, some issues um, with deaths in custody and we have had uh, uh, rioting um, because of uh, injustices in uh, black communities. But as I say, you know, um, white people are now becoming more aware and, and are getting involved. And this, there's a, a, this is a watershed moment. And what, what I really uh, believe is that um, instead of other people jumping on this, this bandwagon with their different causes, whether it's Palestine, Kashmir, um, gender issues, or uh, I think that uh, we should drop everything and focus on Black Lives Matter so that they eventually get to the table and start negotiating, talking about rep uh, reparations, talking about um, equality and justice. And I, I think that uh, the, the tide is turning. I really think that the, the, they are um, going to achieve something, but it's taken centuries of um, enslavement, of abuse, of injustices, of racism, of bigotry, and and um, and it, the the movement is is global. And what has happened in America is impacting people in um, in Britain as well in a in a good way, I think. And um, we're certainly starting to look more closely at these people on statues. When you um, see, like, on the news, what's happening in American urban centers, like rioting and things like that, um, you know, I've heard both sides of the, there's people that will justify it, right? Because you force people into a certain situation, so what are you going to expect? Secondly, or some people are like, no, that's still a crime, they should be arrested. What's, what's your take when you see stuff like that? Do you think, because we earlier mentioned that, when we talked about Palestine, that um, the oppressed can't just raise their hand like hey will you please unoppress me like you have to fight it take it back so in light of that what's your take on when you see like riots and things in the, in the in these american urban centers when injustice is the law resistance is the duty of everyone now whether that's peaceful resistance or something else you look back in history uh when changes are made in history it's brought about because of people power People power brought down the Berlin Wall. It wasn't politicians. It wasn't um, Reagan standing up saying, get rid of this wall. Um, it was ordinary people that uh, made that change. And w whenever you look at um, moments in history where you go, gosh, you know, the, the Arab awakening, the changes that came about came about because of people power. Um, the young man Mohammed Bouazizi in, in Tunisia who set fire to himself, you know, that was one of those watershed moments. It wasn't the politicians that brought it about. Um, the same with the, the Libyan revolution. But unfortunately, uh, people hijack these movements and uh, deliberately or unwittingly lead, lead them in, into the long grass or take their eyes off the ball. This is one of the things that I'm afraid uh, could happen in Idlib with HGS. You know, unless they get their mojo back and get their act together again and, and start remembering who they are and who they're representing. Um, the, the whole Bilal Abdul Karim talk situation could uh, could be really damaging. So, what I would say is, uh, you know, for any movement, um, keep 
the focus. Don't be sidetracked. Don't uh, be led into the the long grass. And um, and I'm I'm worried that uh, the Black Lives uh, Matter movement could easily be distracted and and taken down a, a different route. At the moment, it's on course to get to that big table to start real, honest and open negotiations. So like, uh, I'll tell you what happened was it last week in Chicago, or the week, like within the last two weeks in Chicago, right? There's a neighborhood called Inglewood. It's on, a, it's on the southwest side of Chicago. It's one of notoriously one of the most violent neighborhoods in the city. And Black Lives Matter came in there and they were going to do a protest. And the Inglewood community members, the, their heads said, no, you guys did not clear this with us. So we have an established relationship with our community law enforcement. Um, y'all should have cleared it with us first because there's something we're working on and now you are coming in from the outside as an intr- as like almost like an intruder in a way, right? Y'all, we'd be happy to work with y'all, but y'all should have cleared it with us first because they were coming in saying this is our streets and the Inglewood folks were like, no, these are our streets. Y'all don't live here. You know what I'm saying? So I think there has to be like some care in that. I think personally that People who, um, in general, like I think what you're saying is don't let the anecdotal side stuff, like you'll see somebody during these riots, there's somebody with legit grievances, but then there's somebody who's going to the Apple store with a new iMac, right, and running off. I think what you're saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that let's not let these side anecdotes distract us from the big picture. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. You know, there, there will be um, distractions uh, mainly negative, maybe some positive, but there will be distractions. Keep the focus going. You know, the um, it, it's the same with the gun laws in America. The, the kids in Florida who really started this movement, um, it, it was incredible, but now it seems to have petered out. And um, I'm not sure how the momentum was lost but that was growing into something really quite um special and it's very easy for great movements to get sidetracked um greta thornburg has um been incredible in it an incredible sort of polarizing um figure and she's she's managed to become a lightning rod for loads of environmental issues without getting distracted. You know, she's very single-minded or maybe the, the people behind her or who are keeping her going are very um, single-minded. But that, that movement, the environmental issue, has, uh, is, is still going strong. So it, it's really you know, get a get a focus and, and keep that focus going. In Palestine at the moment, I think the only show in town is BDS. And it's hmm. obviously hugely, hugely um, effective because it is gathering so much momentum, but it is also gathering so many enemies and uh, it, it, it's obviously working. You know, you know, Yvonne, that's one of the, at least majority of the protesting and things like that, that at least many polit- political scientists of various backgrounds have kind of agreed that protesting on its own doesn't make any much of a difference. They've understood that the mo- what makes people change and move and uh, behave differently is economic factors when you're hurting their pockets. And so much so that this is what the Zionist lobby primarily sees as its number one threat in the country. So much so that if even a U.S. teacher, a teacher in a public school is a supporter of BDS, they will um, uh, what, they will remove them from uh, from teaching or, or revoke their licenses. I, I think that's there's some law in Texas that prevents teachers from even joining a BDS Hmm. Uh, type well, of a yeah, they framed it. It was automatically anti-Semitic. You sent anti-Semitic. You see what happened to Linda Sarsour this week. Yeah, like she's been on the Democrat band, like you know, pushing that for forever. 
and the Biden campaign was like, oh, she had, we have nothing to do with her. We'd like yeah. disown. You know what I mean? It, it's like it's embarrassing almost because for for at least when you look at your sister on a Muslim level, you see her being kind of humiliated, but then you know that she's also kind of put herself in that situation where she's done everything that they've asked her and they still won't accept her. And then you see that she will probably go even further and make, she won't give up in her attempts to appease the Democrats and trying to be accepted into the, the mainstream uh, by overcompensating, in yeah, other areas. Overcom- yeah, overcompensating, right. and even probably, uh, perhaps sacrificing whatever principles that you you hold in, in that regard. So I would hope she would go the op- where it's like, all right, if BDS is non, like I would assume as a Palestinian woman that she would be not, that's non negotiable, and that might be the thing that's like that, right? But it's this this whole rhetoric of like, oh, we're gonna elect Biden and Harris and then hold them accountable, which is un- which is doesn't sound make any sense, like. We don't hold our presidents accountable. They, you hold them accountable by voting them out after four years, but you let them do all the damage for four years, do whatever they want, and then you vote, and then you bring in yeah. somebody else who's going to do the same thing. It's such a difficult situation <laughs> for for many, um, at least personalities, Muslims who are, um, you know, engaged in, in media and kind of, they they see Linda doing everything that they wanted done, you know doing the women's march etc all the all the things they wanted her to do and then yet still being um given the smack in the face and saying you know what it's not good enough you have earned the ire of uh certain jewish lobbies and thus you cannot be accepted and and that's pretty much what's been told to her well it's it's tough and it is, and but you look at um, AOC and and uh, other uh, women who are really uh, making inroads um, in the Democrats, and you know, a couple of or three or four years ago, they would have been buried by the Democrats, um, but the popular movement of people behind them is is so great now that um, it's very difficult for the Democrats to uh, to remove them. And, and the, again, the, the tide is changing very slowly, but it is changing. And, um, you know, you, you talk about the Jewish lobby groups, but um, we're really talking about the pro-Israeli groups because there are a lot of uh, Jews who are against Zionism, um, who are uncomfortable about some of the foreign policies uh, and, and some of the internal policies, domestic policies of Israel. Um, That's correct, yeah. I meant the Zionist lobbies. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very um, important to, uh, to differentiate um, between the great Jewish religion and... Uh, the political ideology of Zionism. And let's remember, uh, there are um, Christians outnumber, uh, Christian Zionists outnumber Jewish Zionists probably 10 to 1. You know, 50 million Christian Christian Zionists voted for for Trump. And, and, um, you know, this is a very strong pro-Israeli lobby. so uh, you know it's it's important to um to remember that as well but yes you know there are individuals who are hounded and targeted and we should try and give them as much support as we can yeah and the bds has to be the most effective tool and has to be focused on it. i know like there's many different uh palestinian groups uh the you know uh, it's like an AMP, American Muslim for Palestine. I think that's one of the big groups here that um, that have a conference here. And I, I'm just wondering what exactly happens at these conferences. I think I should probably go to one of these because... They're always in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanksgiving but, weekend, but, but there's too much football going on. American football. I, yeah. I really think what the problem is yeah. over BDS. BDS is a peaceful civil action um, that began in Palestine with ordinary Palestinians. And as I say, the the key word, peaceful. 
It is peaceful and it is so effective. It is really incurring the wrath of um, of, of all sorts of uh, individuals. Yes, and the fact that major corporations had to come out and explain that we are not... Um, donors or we're, we're not affiliated with anything related to Israel that in itself shows that it, how effective it is I mean how, how many of us have googled oh is Starbucks um, a donor of Israel or is is Pepsi because th these are some things that we, you hear from you know so and so relative like oh so and so is um, donating money to Israel and then you just want to make sure you do a fact check real quick and then there's <laughs> actually official statements from the company uh, yeah. you know where they say oh well in the past we've done it and we don't longer done it or something like that you know um, even Starbucks had to do that to ordinary people the politicians they are slow to act the when big changes are made it comes through people power so to all of your listeners and viewers never underestimate your own strength your own ability um, to to make change and you know big changes in history are brought about through people power one of um, the most effective in the 1950s and uh, to my shame I forget her name at the moment but she refused to get up from her bus seat in Montgomery oh, and, for the parks yes and 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 give it to a white man so um you know one one woman changed the course of changed the course of history the civil rights movement yep something right. as simple as this i i, I want to get a very clear i want to ask you a very clear question because like what happened with sister linda this week right you see a lot of her longtime critics like haha told you so you know this is what happens um what should be the appropriate response because like, a lot of people have disagreements with her because of her social positions on things like you know aligning with like maybe pro le like leftist organizations right at the same time i do feel sincerely she has the best interests of muslims i met her a couple times in person and i do feel like she has the best interests of muslims at heart right and is trying to but you know navigate certain things almost you know see you're making compromises and a lot of times muslims don't think that's appropriate how should we re respond to her how 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 should we support her? Is it appropriate for us to like, kind of say, I told you so, when this happens to her? Or w what's your take for someone who's putting in that work? Yeah, the, the most useless phrase that anybody can say is, I told you so. <laughs> and and uh, it's not just in the Muslim community, you know, it's in these curtain twitches are in all communities. Um, if you really want to help the sister stand shoulder to shoulder with her and give her support and uh, if you think that she's doing something wrong um, do what Bilal Abdul Karim did and point it out you know only your good friends will tell you when something isn't right your enemies won't say a word they'll be happy to see you go blithely on and, and fail. Um, so, you know, we, we should be more supportive as a community. Uh, we should have more backbone as a community. And I would also, now this is going to upset some, but I would also urge um, a lot of the male leaders, uh, community leaders to step aside and let the women take over. Um, you know, you you look at the state of the Muslim world today, and it is because of incompetent male rulers, because of the patriarchy, and people might say, "Oh yes, well, what about um, Sheikh Hasina?" In, in Bangladesh and, mm. and Benazir Bhutto and and, uh, and and Gandhi, all these women um, are part of the patriarchy or were part of the patriarchy. Um, you know, had they been born uh, men, they still would have gone into power after their fathers. 
um, Aung San Suu Kyi, she's another um, uh, victim of, of the patriarchy. So um, yes, there are uh, women leaders who, um, who just perpetuate um, the misogyny and, and the um, dreadful uh, rule, rulership that um, has gone on in in these dynasties but i would say to um you know look look around the world where things are happening the uh covid pandemic for instance the countries that are doing incredibly well new zealand finland um south korea uh taiwan singapore scotland all female leaders who have gender balanced uh, governments and cabinets and that there's a message in there you look at the pictures of the OIC it's wall-to-wall -wall men who are disastrous they're absolutely disastrous <laughs> if they're not fighting their funding fighting um, they they're fueling um, the starvation of millions of children in Yemen, in Syria, um, Libya, as I said before, is a basket case. All of this money that's rolling in to keep the war machines going are, are coming from oil-rich states run by men who I wouldn't put in charge of a cabbage patch. Yvonne, you know? <laughs> you, 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 I, I've been... Uh, <laughs> I've been of the view, and I, I've been trying to tell our listeners that, you know, if if we try to take the the most oppressed uh, intersections of our community, whether it's, it's women, the disabled people, people who are short, let's just say, you know, the most <laughs> fat, whatever, however many uh, oppressed categories you want to put them, and you line them up into these positions of of power and leadership in the OIC in in various leaderships of the countries, they'll behave the same way because the way that our our the systems have been set up are in a position to express exploit every weakness, every characteristic of humanity, every um, worst aspect of humanity has been uh, even to the point that it's it's your attention that they're fighting for now it's just a, m a matter of you clicking a button on your phone that ex attention is being exploited to the highest capabilities trying to figure out which color in an advertisement a person a is more likely to click on so making sure that the uh, the pop-up window showing up on your screen is is the color that is more likely to be clicked on so what, what my argument has always been is at least through the show has been that don't get into these um, identity or g wars, g gender wars, because it's, it's sidetracking the issue. When you, when you uh, start framing this as a, a man versus woman issue or black versus white, white I, I am of the view that even if they gave reparations to black people in this country, that still doesn't solve the problem because the system is still geared to oppress them. Just look at um, the UK, for example. There, there's the system is a, a, a geared or, or configured to oppress the least common denominator. It's is the fight find the least path of resistance. The, yeah, the least path of resistance and exploit the people who cannot fight back and organize and be able to. Uh, pick themselves up together and get some education, form communities with strong parenting, strong uh, a father figure, uh, a strong mother. You know, you see, that's why you see the differences between when immigrants come to this country and you see um, a lot of the impoverished communities in, in, in the West, why those communities haven't been able to get out is because many of the immigrants that do come in even despite they're coming from a poor background is that they have a strong nuclear family they have the the things that were that are missing from the indigenous um impoverished communities in in the country so uh, at least from what i'm seeing i i try to stay away from this um the struggle of of, of some, some leftist causes where they just kind of try to 
categorize everything. There's like a, a man versus woman issue or a black versus white. I think we need to start kind of getting out of this and seeing that there are much more deeper issues in hand when especially when we're seeing people like obama who came to power a, a black man you thought that he would fight for every type of injustice that was there and you saw that he bombed the heck out of the muslim countries much more than bush did you know well, he didn't fix his own black neighborhoods yeah he didn't he didn't help out the black neighborhoods he didn't help out anything when you really go down to it the, his whole the whole crowning achievement was the the healthcare uh, thing and that that in itself is incredibly ineffective and uh, Sheikh Hamra has been one who, <laughs> yeah. who messed around with the with the what's it called the <laughs> Obamacare uh, Obamacare oh, yeah. and has had numerous problems with it and uh, I, I just I want people to get beyond the the me the category thing you know short versus tall fat versus skinny <laughs> you know uh, disabled versus able-bodied blind versus sighted these type of things are just bringing us all down i think go ahead well you would say that some might say because you're a bloke, a bloke. <laughs> <laughs> you're a bloke let's go, let's go back in in history and you know people keep saying we've got no great role models in islam and i say what about our beloved Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, you know, he is as relevant today as he was in the seventh century. But you you look at uh, Islam, the growth of Islam, how it developed from this little desert corner in the world uh, to flourish the way that it did. And at the height of Islam, we had uh, the greatest architects, the greatest engineers, the greatest doctors, the first hospitals, uh, the greatest scientists, the greatest mathematicians. And it's like, well, where are we today? Where, how did it go to the, the, the situation we are today? And you look at this golden age in Islam and women were standing shoulder to shoulder with the men. Now they've been airbrushed out of the uh, the landscape. Uh, we've been given a back seat, and it's like, how did we allow this to happen? Yeah. How did we allow this to happen? And and um, so you know, we need to go back into um, the golden era of Islam and bring it back again yeah, yeah and in, it's the ideas the of, of days, um, the third caliph and I'm not a, a Muslim scholar but the third caliph um, Uthman right. um, who, who was this is when the, um, the the Muslim world was really flourishing he put two women in charge of the markets in charge of the economy in Mecca and then in, in uh, Medina. And these women were enforcing his laws, enforcing the rules with uh, shoppers, with traders, um, seeing that Islamic law was followed, that nobody was uh, shortchanging anyone. And uh, the, you know these markets flourished. And that makes, uh, makes you realize that uh, the traders must have been men and women and the shoppers must have been men and women and that it was a mixed society and that as i say these women were enforcing his laws and people were obeying them now you fast forward to uh, to today and some men insist on um they don't even want to look at women. They they have to have a big curtain up and and uh, the segregation. And I just think, where does this come from? Hmm. Sheikh Amr, as a male supremacist, can you comment? <laughs> as a male supremacist, <laughs> so no, he, he, this this guy is extreme. Yeah, say, I'm, I'm not I'm... a scholar, and and I so I I, I would want to hear what the brother has to say 
Yeah, so I, I think this is a, an amalgam of a whole... It's, it's, there's a lot of different... Uh, so many layers to it. Yeah, to, not only that, there's so many different things at play that are simultaneously moving, you know. Um, I think of it as like an engine. There's so much, there's society that you live in that happens to be a non-Muslim society. There's societies that you live in which are Muslims, but Islam is not practiced very much. And then you have other societies which want to be different than other societies. Let's take Saudi Arabia, for instance, that they want to counterbalance everything that they see in the Muslim world to be the most unique. And then that ends up being sometimes um, or many times um, an overcompensation of what they deem to be Islam, right? So there's a lot of things at play here. But um, I, 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 again, I also personally think um, what you made as a dua that the golden era has to come back, I agree with you 100%. And what exactly was the golden era? It was a set of believers who felt whether they liked it or not, or whether it was comfortable for them or not, they had to implement what their creator expected from them, and even in buying and selling, right? And you were referring to, um, and I think when you said Uthman, it may have been Umar ibn Abdul Aziz that had employed uh, also women to be the caretakers of the market to make sure that people were actually practicing business according to the Quran and the Sunnah, right? So yeah. what, what you mentioned is actually something very brilliant and phenomenal. If the idea exists as far as servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the core, then we're going to see golden eras and we're going to see golden ages. And even if there's not a golden era and a golden age, we're still adhering to what Allah wants us to do, right? But again, to answer your question even, even further, is there Islamic evidence for us where you where people are trying to be careful. So there's a difference between doing something uh, to be careful and there's something if you believe something that everyone has to follow. When people don't want to, let's say, associate with women, are they doing it because they feel that women are less or because they think that they're following Islam, right? And But are they letting that affect the progress of human society, right? Um, is it that Sister Rivan Ridley, no, she can't come on because we're not going to talk to a woman? Or is it, no, she's our sister, we're going to talk to her, and we're going to make sure we use these boundaries that Islam set out for us, and we're going to have a very productive conversation because her life is a history book on its own, and we can, every, I think everyone can benefit and be inspired from it, right? So even though that there's boundaries, we still have to respect those boundaries, um, and we still have to continue moving forward. Rasulullah Sallam obviously used to discuss with women they used to come to him with questions that even Aisha radiallahu anha in Sahih al-Bukhari some of the women would be some of the women came to Rasulullah and asked about very very personal female issues and Aisha radiallahu anha got embarrassed but Muhammad sallallahu didn't get embarrassed right even though he may have showed some shyness but he still had to answer the question because it was knowledge. So there's there's nothing in Islam that tells us that we have to completely uh, disassociate ourselves from women. No, we all live in a society, and we all want to build a vibrant society. We all have to discuss and 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 but be professional with each other. Um, but I still think that yes, women are very very much uh, oppressed in uh, a majority of the world. Um, I believe it's not an issue of masculinity per se. I think masculinity is now used and now people don't know how to use, utilize their masculinity um, for, for a decent portion. But I think it comes down to uh, the product of the environment. People are a product of their environment and the way that they're bought up and the system that governs them um, is actually putting them, uh, driving their senses and driving their emotions to a certain Direction, I mean, it's well, not allowing the Islam to flourish within them. Well, what's the what's the most exploitive characteristic of a woman? It's her sexuality, and that's what it's being exploited throughout the world. And yes. that's what's seen to our as as parents of, of daughters. We we fathers, that's what we worry about our daughters. Who's going to exploit their their sexuality for their own benefit? And we want to make sure that that they're protected against that, and we want to be uh, vanguards and, and and use our masculinity to protect them against that, so that they can 
achieve their their dreams or whatever they, they want i mean uh well whether it's in the arts or or it's in the media it's in um you know maths or sciences or etc you know you yeah. want to be able to fulfill those dreams and be that 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 person can, that can facilitate those those dreams for them you know and uh, i think that's what's really missing at least from uh, fathers yeah and, the, it, and the, I, th- I think the other thing is if, if somebody wants to put up a curtain or a barrier between where men and women are i don't think it's the notion that they say that they're thinking that they're better than women or that they want to disassociate themselves from women um i think uh, a big portion or a majority of of the time it's that we want to have a separate quarters if we have control in a situation islam wants us it's especially when it's something very festive and people want to dress how they want to dress. Some women want to feed their children if you know if they're nursing and everyone wants to be a little, you know, be able to take off their hijab, be able to relax, be able to do their own thing. So when we get together for parties and dawats, you know, whatever, uh, you know, whatever the case is, we want to be able to put up a barrier, temporary barrier, because in society we're all together anyway. But in this situation where festivities happen, it's very, very easy to change course and human interaction changes, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to kind of, you know, uh, 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 put up something that would uh, not misdirect our attention for the sake of, for the point of what the gathering, you know, had gathered for, you know, um, and some, you know, some people, and I'm not saying this directly to you, I think I'm glad you mentioned it and it's, it's worth the benefit. Um, people have the same issue with, you know, masjids having uh, a curtain or a border or or whatever a, a wall if you even want to call it does that mean that a woman's section which I, I actually have spoken about many times a woman's section of a masjid shouldn't be some dump it should be just as nice and beautiful as any other masjid and any other place of the masjid um I'm glad to hear it because you know this is um i i don't have an issue with um segregation when i'm going to pray um, I don't have an issue with that. And as you've brilliantly pointed out, when you do get festive occasions, when people do want to let their hair down, then um, it is appropriate to have um, segregation. But I, I'm just talking about, um, you know, university lecturers or conferences or workplaces uh, where it's isn't necessarily practical and when people are going to a conference surely they're going there to listen to the speakers not try and and ogle whichever person could be next to them or you know it, it's mm-hmm. uh, but yes i can um as, as you've very eloquently explained um, and, and I guess you'll probably be talking about wedding parties and and other celebrations. I can see that. Right. I can see the the practical. By the way, I'm not a male chauvinist like Mahin said. <laughs> are, are, are you guys? Um, you know. So, like, by the way, have you got like? I think what Sister Yvonne's talking about is like sometimes you have classes like lectures, and the sister section is like, you know, the the brothers have like access to the speaker. And then a sister section, you can't even, sometimes you can't even see the dude. Have y'all ever, it's like when we go to Juma and it's overflow, you go to the overflow room and you can't hear, you can't see anything. You just hear some dude. It sucks. I just go, I just like, I usually fall asleep. Um, so I, I can emphasize, I can empathize with that idea, right? Especially when it's perceived like I, you know, as someone who, you know, I've taken a lot of classes, Islamic classes and whatnot. The sisters are always hey, don't the dominant, brag, okay? We right? should be humble a little bit. <laughs> Oh, to... I didn't say I learned anything. I just said oh, I took them. Oh, okay, you just, you just took them. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I was just there. Um, but there's this, I, you you mentioned something just now. It was an example. Fifteen years ago, I remember when I was in Ohio, when Al Maghrib Institute first came to like was was started pop off in 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 America um, when we had our first class, and some brothers were like, "Oh, there's some sisters here. They're like really enjoying the fact that they can, you know." be in the same room with us and they only came to look for partners <laughs> oh. like they actually said that that comes like what you just said like some people actually think that <laughs> like they're only here they're not here to learn anything about because i think the first class we had was like the evolution of fic like yes or mm. and no these sisters came from cleveland ohio they drove two and a half hours 
to look for a to look for a marriage partner. Mm. <laughs> See, you know which which you need to go to Love Notes. That's where you find the marriage partners, right? Love Notes is though, yeah. You, do they you, still do that? They, I, they still, I think that class still exists. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, like, so one thing, segue complete. You are now working. I think you live in Scotland. Um, are you Scottish by background or ethnicity? Like ethnicity. But I know you're yeah. you're for Scottish independence. What what? Tell us about that. That's that's an interesting take. All right, Miss William Wallace. <laughs> I. Um, that's all we know about brave uh, about Scottish independence. Rather, just what Braveheart taught us. And George Galloway, maybe. Yeah. Maybe George. I was, I was born in the north of England. Um, I chose to come and live and work in Scotland. Um, because of the notion of independence. Uh, for nearly 20 years, I lived in central London and uh, covered a lot of the shenanigans of the Westminster Parliament. And I just despaired at um, all of the parties there because uh, they were, a, a lot of them were corrupt. There was no difference between parties. Um, you voted for one, but you got the other. There was a lot of cozy um, coziness between them, and uh, it, 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 you, you could hardly differentiate. You know, they were all in it together. And then I heard about independence in Scotland and started looking into it, and I just thought this would be a great way of uh, of not being ruled by these idiots and and the um these snp of which i'm now a member um i think that uh you know that this is a great way forward and and uh the scots have been after independence for 700 years and i actually think it will happen within the next two or three years I really do, and um, and I, for one, will not be um, sad uh, if uh, if I tear up my British passport and get a Scottish one instead. Wow! Wow! wow. Very that's, cool. That's some powerful words right there. So, and you're in Glasgow? No, I um, I live right in the borders. Uh, where a lot of the fighting took place, where you know near where um, Hadrian's Wall is, and uh, I, um, it, it's a wonderful part of the the UK. The Muslim community here is so much more confident as mm. well. Yeah, um, we have quite a few fans there, by the way. I, I noticed that about the Scots. Mashallah, the. They're, they're, they get, they're a whole different breed of Muslims. Yeah, the justice minister is Scottish. Uh, it, sorry, is, is, um, is a Muslim. Um, Hamza uh, Yusuf. And uh, when he took his oath of office, he wore a uh, kilt. We have our own Islamic tartan in Scotland. Oh, wow. And, uh, he, he wore a kilt and, uh, and gave his oath in Urdu. As oh, well wow. as in English, um, and and uh, you know it's 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 wonderful really to um, when you see somebody in government, but not only in government, but actually a minister in the in the cabinet who's a who's a Muslim. Yeah, and uh, there is a great deal of um, of. Uh, you know, a sense of belonging as well. And we've got quite a few Syrian refugees who've mo moved into the borders. And I went to a couple of uh, events where the local authorities welcomed them and the police were there, the uh, local councillors, um, the education and, and health areas were also represented. And the message to the Syrians was, welcome um, to our country. This is our culture. And we had bagpipes playing and, and um, some Scottish dancing. 
And then they said, so this is our culture, but now we want to learn about your culture. Hmm. And uh, so that we can both, you know, know about each other. And um, and it was really wonderful. And, and they were given uh, the keys to their new homes. And they were told, uh, this is your home for life and for your children as well. Nobody uh-huh. is ever going to... Uh, move you out and um, there was you know, they were just really given a sense of belonging and uh, and a welcome but they were also um, encouraged to retain and not forget their own culture as well and that I thought that was um, that was great you know it wasn't leave your culture at the door and forget about it you're Scottish now it was um, we can all work together without diluting our faith our beliefs our our backgrounds and um, and and I thought that that was important sadly uh, the same message is not given um, in England hmm one one thing I think uh, just a personal issue about you if you don't mind just for like the last minute or two that we're here um, you uh, have a um, of what I've read online. I just want to verify if it's true that you have a uh, very unique lifestyle compared to the uh, average. I would say maybe even uh, uh, a person of you know of your profession. You have a specific type of farm or something. Or I heard there were some rumblings of this uh, that I read online. Is this actually true that you live on a farm and you have some unique animals or something? I do. I. Um... I, I've, uh, I live on a farm with my Algerian husband and we keep sheep and uh, we also run a peacock sanctuary mm. and, uh, and, and that is um, that's quite interesting I don't know whether it was delusions of grandeur but I just thought <laughs> I want to see peacocks roaming uh, and how around. many, how well, many what, do you have? What do you feed peacocks? Um, they eat anything. They're really, uh, they love peanuts, uh, but they, they'll they eat anything. Um, and and uh, So they're like chickens. They get corn and, um, and peanuts. But um, how many do you have? How many a peacocks? Of, of weeks of, of having these peacocks, they were landing on the, the cars, they were oh, doing oh. their business on the cars and peacock poo is quite large oh boy <laughs> that means you need to start slaughtering them the no people eat them people eat peacocks. they do it's supposed to be a delicacy but it's oh, illegal well, it's illegal in india to kill them. peacocks are not uh, not not for eating they're not oh they're yeah not. have some i know se- i heard have some sensitivity man. no i heard well i swear i heard um people eat ke- they do and that it they tastes do, like similar to chicken that's they do, well, it's but supposed to be a delicacy but um you know the peacocks here are uh are here because um, it's a sanctuary for them. Yeah, so, okay. she said but, sanctuary, but, bro. Sanctuary, not <laughs> not <laughs> Yeah, cool. I, I, I don't know why he he would say that sanctuary is a place where you keep some of these animals to preserve them and to keep them safe. And he's talking about eating them. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and I, I also hear you have a, you wrote a, a, a historic a, like a novel of some kind recently. Oh yes. Uh-huh. If you could share uh, that with us. I will. It's called uh, The Caledonians. Okay. And mm. also a copy. Um, What's it about? Is that fiction? It's a Scottish fictional. Uh, uh, it's the first in a, in a trilogy. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, a, a time traveling history master. That's awesome. And, mm. Yeah. I love so, time travel, so uh, I might I might check it out. Please do. Available please on do. Amazon, I take it. Yes, you can get it on Amazon, or um, uh, it's published by Austin Macaulay, and it's called The Caledonians. And uh, the next one should be coming out early in the new year. Um, if I can just finish the last chapter, but I've been struggling with it for the last, well, since the pandemic. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's, it, uh, it, anyway. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. One of the listeners, by the way, is commenting, he misses your coffee shop. 
You, I understand you used to have a coffee shop in the past. My husband has uh, has one in um, in East London, and it's called the Second Wife. <laughs> <laughs> Could go on for another hour on that subject. Oh my gosh! Of amount of time. We'll have to bring you on maybe some other time for that. You know, we we are, we are very uh, pro uh, second, third, and fourth uh, lives here. Even though none of us have, you know, we're all yeah. like singular, singular focus. But you know, there's just like pipe dream. Like you know, I was I was telling my friend last night, like you know, if I ever just had like a a faucet that money just generated all day and I could hire maids and all that stuff, then yeah, I could probably do it, but. Till yeah. that day is not here right now. It probably yeah. never will be. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for our listeners out there, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us at info at uh, info at madthemadmumlips.com. <laughs> Sorry, wrong show. <laughs> and um, support us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the Mad Mom Luke's. Um, and I'm not even going to ask you where to find you. A simple Google, google.com, Yvonne Ridley, and you will find. She's plenty. everywhere. She's everywhere, right? Um, and to check if you're into fiction, definitely check out our book. We want to appreciate you again for coming on, gentlemen. Any party thoughts? No, um, mom. I'm sorry I didn't get dressed up for Yvonne. She said, "You, I can't believe you're wearing that T-shirt <laughs> when you're talking to Yvonne." <laughs> <laughs> it was an honor having you. Next time, I'll wear a Scottish kilt, um, a Muslim <laughs> Scottish kilt, in, in honor of Yvonne. And hopefully, inshallah. she joins us again in the future. Inshallah, inshallah. Thank inshallah. you so much. All right, for my special guest, uh, Dr. Yvonne Ridley, and my co-host Sheikh Amr Saeed Sim. This is Mahin signing off for the Mad Mum Looks. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam.